Now it's time for The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And just when we thought the big news from Arizona today was the House representatives there repealing the 1864 bill, getting three Republicans to switch, uh, we now have 11 Republicans in Arizona <laughs> indicted. It's, it's 7 p.m. in Arizona right now, uh, Alex, and there's 11 indicted fake electors there who... Uh, may be struggling with, uh, Maybe with what, thinking they, about, what uh, they want for dinner at this yeah. particular hour. Maybe thinking about what they should do in the in the medium term. Mm -hmm. Maybe thinking, maybe thinking not be, uh, on the, on the stand, maybe, maybe being witnesses for the prosecution. Maybe, maybe yeah. just maybe. And we all discovered tonight that in Arizona law, co-conspirator is written without a hyphen. Never, never seen that before, but you know, there's 50 <laughs> that, states. That's a sign of the times, isn't yeah. it? How do they spell, how do they punctuate co-conspirator <laughs> right. in gonna, Arizona? We've yeah. certainly seen the word a lot. We're sign gonna, of the we're times, We're going to learn Lawrence. that in every state. Thank we you, sure Alex. might. Have a good show. Thanks, Alex. Well, the breaking news of the night is that Donald Trump's name appears in another indictment. This one in Arizona, the Attorney General of Arizona, has charged 11 Republican fake electors and seven Trump associates, including Mark Meadows and Rudolph Giuliani, with a criminal conspiracy involving several felonies. The indictment says it was, quote, a scheme or artifice to defraud by preventing the lawful transfer of the presidency of the United States, keeping President Donald J. Trump in office against the will of Arizona voters and depriving Arizona voters of their right to vote and have their votes counted under the United States Constitution, Arizona Constitution, Article 7. Donald Trump also appears later in the indictment in the detailed description of the crimes as unindicted co-conspirator one. Quote, defendants' attempts to declare unindicted co-conspirator one and Pence, the winners of the 2020 presidential election contrary to voter intent and the law involved numerous other charged and uncharged co-conspirators. The names of all of the defendants who are residents of Arizona were revealed publicly in the indictment, but the names of seven other out-of-state defendants are still redacted since they have not yet been served with the indictment or weren't yet served with the indictment when it was released. Mark Meadows' name is redacted in the indictment, but it could not be more obvious in this line that begins with a redaction and says redaction was unindicted co-conspirator one's chief of staff in 2020. Mystery solved. The other Trump associates easily identifiable from the description of their actions in the indictment are attorneys John Eastman and Jenna Ellis, Trump aide Boris Epstein, Christina Bob, and Trump campaign operative Mike Roman. The indictment says defendants and unindicted co-conspirators schemed to prevent the lawful transfer of the presidency to keep unindicted co-conspirator one in office against the will of Arizona's voters. This scheme would have deprived Arizona voters of their right to vote and have their votes counted. Republican presidential elector defendants then voted for President Donald Trump and Vice President Michael Pence on December 14th, 2020, falsely claiming to be the duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president from of the United States from the state of Arizona. Defendants deceived the citizens of Arizona by falsely claiming that those votes were contingent only on a legal challenge that would change the outcome of the election. In reality, defendants intended that their false votes for Trump-Pence would encourage Pence to reject the Biden-Harris votes on January 6, 2021, regardless of the outcome of the legal challenge. The scheme failed when Vice President Michael Pence accepted all certified Biden-Harris votes on January 6, 2021. The indicted fake electors include Kelly Ward, who was the chair of the Arizona Republican Party, who was indicted along with her husband, Michael Ward, as a fake elector. Two Republican members of the state legislature have been indicted as fake electors, Jacob Hoffman and Anthony Kern. For anyone who still needs a lesson in how much your vote matters, the Democratic Attorney General of the state of Arizona won her election by 280 votes, 280 votes out of 
two and a half million votes cast. So if a couple hundred people didn't get to vote that day or voted differently in that election, we would not be reading these indictments tonight. Tonight, Arizona's Attorney General, Chris Mays, announced the indictments. Hi, I'm Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays. Let me start by thanking everyone for your patience as we conducted a thorough and professional investigation over the past 13 months into the fake elector scheme in our state. I understand for some of you today didn't come fast enough, and I know I'll be criticized by others for conducting this investigation at all. But as I have stated before and will say here again today, I will not allow American democracy to be undermined. We're here because justice demands an answer to the efforts that the defendants and other unindicted co-conspirators allegedly took to undermine the will of Arizona's voters during the 2020 presidential election. Arizona's election was free and fair. The people of Arizona elected President Biden. Unwilling to accept this fact, the defendants charged by the state grand jury allegedly schemed to prevent the lawful transfer of the presidency. The defendants and other unindicted co-conspirators raised false claims of widespread voter fraud in Arizona to pressure elections officials to change the outcome of a transparent, free, and fair Democratic election. Those efforts ultimately failed when officials stood firm, followed their statutory duties, and officially certified Arizona's election on November 30th, 2020. These defendants deceived the citizens of Arizona by falsely claiming that those votes were contingent only on a legal challenge that would change the outcome of the election. In reality, the defendants intended that the false votes for Trump and Pence would encourage Vice President Pence to reject the certified Biden-Harris electors' votes, regardless of the result of any legal challenge. As you will recall, none of the legal challenges filed in Arizona state and federal courts regarding the 2020 election were remotely successful at any stage of the case. That scheme failed when Vice President Pence upheld the rule of law and accepted all certified Biden-Harris votes on January 6, 2021. A state grand jury made up of everyday, regular Arizonans has now handed down felony indictments for all 11 Republican electors, as well as several others connected to this scheme. These charges include fraud, forgery, and conspiracy. These charges are Class 2, 4, and 5 felonies. These are serious indictments. Our office will continue its investigation into the efforts to illegally subvert the results of the 2020 presidential election. Leading off our breaking news discussion at this hour is Timothy Hefe. He is a criminal defense attorney and former U.S. attorney. He served as lead investigator for the January 6th committee. Also with us, Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He's co-host of the podcast Prosecuting Donald Trump. He's an MSNBC legal analyst. And Andrew, uh, now that you've had a little time uh, with this indictment, uh, I just want to put up on the screen for the audience as we discuss it, the list of the charges, the six different crimes uh, that include forgery, tampering with a public record. Uh, what do you make of, of what you're reading here? A couple things. One, it is very similar to what we have seen in other states where there have been charges in Georgia and Michigan, um, where this was a top down scheme. And what I mean by that is that Tim and his colleagues put together a vast amount of proof. It was then uh, added onto by Jack Smith, which showed that this scheme of a fake elector scheme was happening from the campaign down to the states. This was not something that was bubbling up at a grassroots level. And that's why you're seeing fake electors at the Arizona level and people at the campaign level and into the White House. That's the second point. Um, I was struck by, on page 44 of this uh, indictment, 
Uh, Eric Hirschman seems to be quite, who was a White House counsel, seems once again to be very much an important witness in the case, and he is on a text message where basically he and a colleague are talking about how they're not going to sign off on this because he, he views this as, and this is a quote in the indictment, certifying illegal votes. Certifying illegal votes is what he wrote, and he said someone else is going to have to sign it, and he says, Rudy, Boris, and Jenna. And those names are actually the three of the people who are charged, um, or appear to be charged. So those are my, my quick takes of the charges here. Uh, Tim, uh, did you learn anything in, in this indictment that you hadn't already uh, had a pretty clear sense of in the January 6th investigation? Yeah, Lawrence, a, a few details, but not the big picture. The, the big picture has been clear for a while. And as, as Andrew just said, this was a top-down, intentional part of the plan, the generation of these fake electors, which then becomes essentially a predicate for Vice President Pence or for the Supreme Court or, or some entity to do something to prevent the transfer of power. So there's some color, there's some details that uh, of which we were not aware. We did not talk to as many people about Arizona specifically as the attorney general has done, but it doesn't change this sort of core narrative that the fake electors were an indispensable means to perpetuate this multi-part plan to try to prevent uh, the certification and the transfer of power. Uh, Andrew Weissman, uh Kenneth Cheeseborough doesn't appear in this indictment. He, of course, uh, was indicted in Georgia and has already pleaded guilty in Georgia. And there were reports indicating that he had actually traveled to Arizona uh, to cooperate with this investigation. You know, that seems to be the main reason why he would not be charged here, is that he is actually cooperating or maybe I should say, at least cooperating enough to not be charged. Um, you know, it, it's still, I think, the jury's out about just how candid um, he has been. But it's, it's otherwise hard to explain why his name does not appear. And presumably, it's because he has counsel who has said, look, if you do not want to be on, as Tim and I used to say in our prior jobs, on the other side of a V, meaning, you know, United States versus, or in this case, Arizona versus, um, you need to start, you know, finding religion and, you know, join Team America. Um, so it's possible that that is the main reason that you don't see his name here, because otherwise, as Tim knows very well from, you know, having investigated this deeply, you know, he was in the thick of things, and, you know, we know that actually also from his own plea in Georgia. So this meeting of the fake electors was publicized at the time. I think we actually have video of it where they allowed uh, it to be covered, actually, as though it was uh, some kind of real event with some uh, import to it. Um, we can, we'll show that video in the control room as soon as we can put it. There it is. So, that, so that's the actual meeting right there that we're putting on the screen. That, that, those are the indicted fake electors uh, sitting there. And they, the, the attorney general in the indictment stresses that they were lying about the purposes of that meeting. At the time, they were saying that we will only use these electors in the event that Donald Trump somehow wins one of his legal cases in court that could then allow these electors to be used. And the attorney general's indictment says uh, absolutely not. They always planned to try to use these electors on January 6th, no matter what happened in court. Uh, and Tim, there's a last line that appears uh, in, in, w at, at the end of the charge against every elector beginning with Kelly Ward. And the last line says, she did not withdraw her vote, even though no legal challenge successfully changed the outcome of Arizona's 2020 presidential election. That same line appears at the end of the description of every other elector and what they did. And it seems in reading it uh, that this attorney general uh, would not be bringing this prosecution if they actually did what they publicly claimed they were going to do, which is withdraw these electors uh, once yeah. the election was certified for Joe Biden. Yeah, Lawrence, exactly right. There was 
one fake electorate to whom we spoke in Georgia who analogized the fake elector certificates in that state to Super Bowl T-shirts. He said, look, before the Super Bowl, you print T-shirts that say both teams won so that whoever actually wins, there are T-shirts already printed that show that they're the champions. The other ones just get tossed because the outcome doesn't turn out consistent with the T-shirt. And there were fake electors in Georgia and other states who believed that this was essentially the same, a contingency. But the language that you just cited shows that the Arizona electors knew that really isn't tied to the success of any case because the cases had been filed, the cases had been largely disposed of, had not prevailed. And even after they weren't withdrawn when all the cases in Arizona are rejected for lack of evidence. So the theory here is that there was never any serious contingency. These were meant to be an apparatus for Mike Pence to choose for political motivation the Trump electors because of these vague suspicions of voter fraud absent any evidence. That's what makes it criminal, right? Not a good faith, hey, just in case election, the, the, the litigation goes one way, we need this backup plan. The lack of withdrawal, as that language reflects, shows that this was always meant to apply and be sent and be considered by Congress regardless of the election of the litigation. Uh, Andrew, a uh, big difference between uh, the Georgia indictment and this indictment. Donald Trump doesn't make it into the indicted column uh, in this indictment. Donald Trump, as we recall, made his debut in criminal indictments as individual one in New York in the federal indictment of Michael Cohen in the Stormy Daniels payoff case. Uh, and now tonight in Arizona, he is a co-conspirator one. Uh, what is the difference in the evidence between uh, Georgia and Arizona? Obviously, we don't have a tape recorded uh, telephone call with the secretary of state of Arizona. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that obviously is a huge piece of evidence that Georgia has. It's not clear yet why we have alter egos being charged in Arizona, but not the ego, <laughs> the main principal person for whom this is done. Uh, the fake electors didn't do this on their own. Uh, people like Rudy Giuliani, all of the sort of amanuensises, the the lawyers, they're all staff to somebody who is the president. Um, but it's unclear, you know, what the lack of proof is. But, you know, for sure, it is because they somehow don't have enough direct evidence yet against him. But it's, it's important to note that I stress the word yet. These are state charges, which means regardless of who wins the presidential election, whether it's Biden or Trump, it doesn't matter because the, you cannot have a federal pardon of these cases. So these people are going to be going to trial in Arizona uh, on these charges. And just to be clear what Tim is saying, so people understand that this is no joke, This is, these charges, if proved, really show this is what you see in, like, you know, petty banana republics. This is this is fundamentally undermining what it means to be a democracy. They're absolutely undermining the votes in these states where the idea is whoever won, that doesn't matter. The democracy is not going to apply. I mean, this could not be a greater threat to this country over its entire history. Uh, we're going to squeeze in a quick break here. Uh, with, there's much more on this when we come back, including some information we're being reported tonight about the grand jury uh, that issued uh, this indictment. We're going to be right back. The defendant Republican presidential electors allegedly plotting with additional defendants then voted for Mr. Trump and Vice President Pence on December 14, 2020, falsely claiming to be the duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president of the United States from the state of Arizona. Former federal prosecutors Tim Hafey and Andrew Weissman are back with us. And Tim, uh, the attorney general also said tonight that the investigation is ongoing. They are still working on the investigation. Uh, but when you consider the status of Donald Trump in this indictment as an unindicted, as unindicted co-conspirator, one, 
compared to his status in the Georgia indictment as, a, as, as an indicted uh, criminal guilty of felonies. Uh, it, it may be that when prosecutors are looking at the actions of a president while he's in office, that they feel they need something like that audio recording of Donald Trump calling the Secretary of State in Georgia, in which all of us can hear Donald Trump committing the, the crime. Trump voters all over the country can hear Donald Trump committing the crime in that phone call. And that may be the level of certainty and public certainty in the evidence that prosecutors want uh, for to indict uh, someone for actions that conducted during the presidency. Yeah, I think that's actually, Lawrence, probably correct. In Georgia, the, the Raffensperger call is so damning. It is the president himself personally encouraging the secretary of state to find you know, the number of votes needed to win. We don't have that in Arizona. I think there is some evidence of the president speaking to Rusty Bowers to encourage a special session, but we don't have at least as far as, as the select committee was able to determine, as much evidence as President Trump personally engaging with people in Arizona, as much as he did with folks uh, in Georgia and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. So my guess is that the quantum of evidence of his personal participation beyond being generally in charge and the, the proximate cause of the, uh, the, the strategy that the architect with Eastman and Giuliani of the strategy, more direct evidence of his personal participation in Arizona. Now, as Andrew said, that might come from some of these people if they cooperate. The nature of a conspiracy is it's concerted action. It's people working together. And some of those people say, oh, yeah, I talked to President Trump and he encouraged me to do this or that. There could be additional evidence that comes as a result of cooperation and guilty pleas from some of the 19 people or 20 people that have been indicted thus far. And Andrew, uh, we know uh, Ruel Giuliani is losing his license to practice law. He's under a, a few hundred million dollar judgment uh, for uh, defamation for the uh, poll workers in in Georgia. Uh, he's an, he's indicted in Georgia. Uh, how much pressure does it take uh, for Ruel Giuliani to at some point decide uh, I'm going to tell my story? Well, you would think that pressure is is enough right now, but he is not doing that. Um, you have to remember, in the civil case, the the one that was brought by the two poll workers, where they they got um, about one hundred and fifty million dollars from the jury. That part of that case involved really Giuliani simply defying the judge's discovery orders over and over again, meaning both sides are supposed to turn over discovery, and he simply didn't do it over and over again. And so the judge finally said, look, if you aren't going to turn over the documents you have, I'm going to tell the jury that they should use that against you, and they have, can use that as a presumption against you. And so you really got the strong sense that he is hiding something, because um, he sort of put himself in a real hole in that case because of his conduct in not complying with those orders. Um, here he's facing yet another uh, criminal case. And, you know, he clearly has some very direct evidence. If you go to the um, part that I was just referring to, page 44, there's a discussion there about people saying, I'm not sure what Rudy is telling, essentially, the president. Um, and so that is really something that may be what's missing from the Arizona case. What is Eastman specifically telling the president? What is Rudy Giuliani specifically telling the president? Because, Lawrence, as you said, the difference is between a contingent elector um, scheme and you can have a real contingent elector scheme, but you can't have a fake elector scheme. And so that may be part of the issue, um, that they just don't have that piece nailed down yet. So there's reporting uh, from Politico tonight about the grand jury that conducted this investigation. Uh, it says, a witness who testified to the grand jury told Politico that grand jurors appeared to come from a mix of political backgrounds. Some asked questions that suggested they sympathized with Democrats, while others sounded more politically conservative, and still others were inscrutable. The witness was granted anonymity to discuss the secret proceedings. Regardless of the politics, the witness described the jurors on the whole as energetic and proactive, uh, driving substantial 
lines of questioning, even while prosecutors seemed more focused on nuts and bolts efforts to substantiate discrete pieces of evidence. Uh, Tim, it sounds like an Arizona grand jury. Lawrence, that's America, right? That's how our system works. It's regular people who are summoned for grand jury service or pettit jury service, and they they go to work every day, and then they get this thing in the mail that, that tells them to show up. They're not professionals. They're not part of the deep state like you and me and Andrew and everybody else. They're regular folks. This is democracy <laughs> at its best. The criminal justice system is generally gives authority to regular folks. And that's what's happening in New York City. That's what's happening in Arizona. That's what will happen in Washington, D.C. And for that reason, Lawrence, I think these regular people's decisions have the potential to move the needle of public opinion about these same facts in a way that the retelling of the select committee or of the media or others may not, right? This is regular people that are listening to evidence and doing their best to figure stuff out. Republicans, Democrats from different parts of Arizona that, you know, that put that aside and just do their job. That, again, is democracy. Another day, another indictment. Tim Hafey, thank you very much for joining our discussion. Andrew Weissman, please stay with us for our discussion of the Supreme Court. Tomorrow, the Supreme Court will hear arguments on Donald Trump's claim that he has absolute criminal immunity for any crimes he committed while president, including the crimes mentioned in the new Arizona indictment tonight, which the Supreme Court should be reading before they go to the hearing tomorrow. Andrew Weissman has already written the questions the justices should be asking tomorrow, and he'll give us those questions next. The idea that the, the January 6th trial would be delayed until after the election, you know, in my view, it just can't be the case that a president can attempt to steal an election um, to, to seize power, and we can't hold him to account until after the next election. It is now up to the Supreme Court when Donald Trump will actually go to trial in the January 6th case. Tomorrow, the Supreme Court will hear Donald Trump's appeal of that case and the charges in it, claiming criminal immunity for any and all crimes Donald Trump may have committed while president. On Monday, Donald Trump posted this on social media about the criminal prosecutions he is facing. This is in no way what the founders had in mind. Legal experts and scholars have stated that the president must have full presidential immunity. Donald Trump never mentions any of the founders who believed that or any of the so-called scholars who believe it. Fifteen distinguished historians submitted a brief to the Supreme Court arguing that the founders never intended for the president to be immune from criminal prosecution. In their 34-page brief, the historians say, there is no evidence in the extensive historical record that any of the framers believed a former president should be immune from criminal prosecution. Immunity for the crimes here alleged would be most abhorrent to the framers because immunity would upset the constitutional scheme and aid a president in overriding the people's power over him. The framers would also have been appalled that former President Trump, despite having left office, seeks permanent immunity. Andrew Weissman is back with us. Uh, and Andrew, um, the one thing you didn't want when, if you're the Trump lawyers going into the Supreme Court tomorrow is another indictment tonight describing a criminal conspiracy where Donald Trump is unindicted co-conspirator one and who knows, could at some point be indicted. Uh, but, but you've written and published uh, questions for the Supreme Court tomorrow. And I just want to go straight to question number eight. Uh, that, you, that you wrote <clears throat> before this indictment came out. Uh, and it says, how would organizing alternative electors in coordination with the chair of a major political party involve official acts of a president? That sounds like a good place to begin tomorrow, Andrew. It does. Um, so... Um, you know, we tried to—I wrote this with Professor Goodman at NYU, wonderful, brilliant man, so he should really take the lion's share of the credit for this. But we divided it into two buckets. 
Um, the one that you read relates to the substance. And let's just get real. There is no substance to the claim here. If the Supreme Court were to decide that a president has absolute immunity, we might we can all pack up and go home. We will not live in a democracy. We may have we may have the illusion that we're in a democracy, but we will not be in one. I do not see that happening. The main issue tomorrow is timing. It is all about the fact that there is a stay in place right now that the Supreme Court has the ability to lift tomorrow. They can hear argument and they are capable of saying, you know what, opinion to follow, but we're lifting the stay so the district court can go on her business. Um, and there's every reason to do that, because um, one of the questions we ask is, is to pose to Donald Trump's lawyers the following. You say that you are immune from criminal prosecution, and you say that this criminal prosecution is something that is a, as onerous, is something you shouldn't be laboring under. You say the gag order in this case is hurting you in terms of your speech in running for office. So don't you have every interest in having us decide this case quickly? What possible reason, legitimate reason, do you have for us to delay a ruling on this case? Because there really is no good answer to that question. And, and because I think there's no way that you're going to have five justices say that there is immunity in this case for these charges, there's no reason for the stay to continue one day longer. The stay, in effect, is giving Donald Trump the immunity he seeks, even if the Supreme Court later says presidents are not immune. It's the stay that is actually resulting in this president being immune. Because it is the stay that is actually delaying the trial uh, in the case. And as long as that stay is in place, the trial is frozen and delayed. Uh, I want to go to another question you, you have here that I'm really hoping to hear in the Supreme Court tomorrow. It's so great. I never would have thought of this. It's, it's number 10. It says, if Richard Nixon had ordered the FBI instead of the so-called plumbers to break into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist office, would Nixon have been immune from prosecution? Uh, the, the Nixon plumbers were, were not uh, official government uh, operators at the time that they were committing these crimes. And, and the Trump theory of the case is anything the president does in his official capacity cannot possibly be a crime. And so that's why you say, Basically, they're saying if Nixon had, used, had ordered the FBI to do it and the FBI did it, there would have been no crime. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this it, it's so preposterous what he's saying. The other questions we have are just essentially doing a goose gander, which is so if what you're saying is true, then Joseph Biden could decide that if, if you would be entitled to um, order the assassination of a political rival, are you saying he can order an assassination of a political rival? If you could seize election machines because you think there's fraud in the election, can't you're, aren't you saying he can do it? I mean, this is one where it's even Justices Alito and Thomas footnote the outrageous fact that Thomas is going to sit. Mm -hmm on this case tomorrow and hear it, leave that aside. But even they, I think, cannot, will not stomach the idea of a blanket immunity. They may decide that there's some small area which maybe a president is immune, for instance, foreign relations, some, something that's exclusively or almost exclusively within his province. But it's hard to see that it would be in this case with these charges. Andrew Weissman, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We will be listening to the court tomorrow. And a programming note, Andrew Weissman in, and Neil Katyal will join us in studio tomorrow at this hour after we've all heard the oral arguments at the Supreme Court. MSNBC's coverage of the arguments start at 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow and tomorrow night. I'll join Rachel Maddow for a special primetime coverage of the, of the Supreme Court hearing starting at 8 p.m. That'll go on for two hours before the last word then comes on at 10 p.m. tomorrow night, as usually scheduled. And coming up today, President Joe Biden got an early endorsement from the Construction Workers Union. The endorsement says that Joe Biden has done more to strengthen jobs in the construction services and those unions than Donald Trump ever could. That's next.
Today, President Biden got a big endorsement for a, from a very big group of unions, the construction workers of North America's building trades unions. Well, folks, when I think climate, I think jobs. I think union jobs. Good paying jobs don't require a college degree. You've attracted nearly $700 billion in private sector investment in advanced manufacturing, in semiconductors, clean energy, and so much more here in America, creating tens of thousands of good-paying jobs, building trade jobs. In fact, construction of new factories has more than doubled in our administration. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, Donald Trump still thinks windmills cause cancer. That's what he said. And by the way, remember when he was trying to deal with COVID, he said, just inject a little bleach in your veins. <laughs> he missed it. All went to his hair. And President Trump, Trump promised this. <laughs> I got to be careful. Say it. Say it. He promised this infrastructure week. Well, I tell you what, it took four years. He never built a damn thing, nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. Are you surprised? Look, you're the best in the world. You know, you had my back in 2020, and because of you, I'm standing here as President of the United States of America, because of you. And that's a fact. And because of you, in 2024, we're going to make Donald Trump a loser again. In a statement, North America's Building Trades Union says, North America's Building Trades Unions can honestly say, no elected official has shown our members and their families more respect than President Joe Biden. Through his policies and his personnel, President Biden has demonstrated his laser-like focus on not only rebuilding our nation's infrastructure and manufacturing sector, but rebuilding the American middle class itself. And in a newly released ad, the union's president, Sean McGarvey, explains why the union opposes Donald Trump. You are promising America tonight. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Donald Trump, he's not a good man. He's not a good person. He does not care about anybody in this world except Donald Trump. That's it. That's all. Very clear and present day. Now he's looking to get in that position again to exert revenge on people. I go all the way back to the 80s with Donald Trump and him trying to, you know, get his mug on page six of the New York Post. Hot man. The only difference between the Donald Trump of the 80s and the Donald Trump of today is he feels totally free to let his dark side out. And his dark side is very, very dark and very, very dangerous for this country. We can't let our democracy that we've worked for and we've cherished just disintegrate with the wrong leader at the wrong time. I can tell you that he personally committed to me that he was going to get our pensions fixed. He understood who was affected by these pensions. He assured me, I'm the president of the United States, I'll just call Mitch, I'll tell him to put it in the bill. Is everybody gonna love me? Everybody loves me, right? Is everybody gonna love me? Yes, Mr. President, you fix the pension, everybody's gonna love you. Well, that was wasted breath. There was lots of other things put in that bill. There was tax cuts put in that bill for rich people. Donald Trump promised infrastructure every year. Infrastructure is the easiest of all. Donald Trump was not interested in any of the policy that actually goes along with being president of the United States. Trump was interested in the pomp and circumstance, the plane, the helicopter. It's all about him. Donald Trump is incapable of running anything, let alone the most powerful country in the history of the world. And God help us if he gets anywhere near that White House in the future. Joining our discussion now is Jimmy Williams, Jr., General President of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, an affiliate of the North America's Building Trades Unions. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. You were there today uh, for the, the big endorsement 
uh, you had you had four years of uh, Donald Trump with no infrastructure whatsoever. Uh, Joe Biden gets in, delivers on the infrastructure bill. Uh, I can't think of anything more important to your unions than that work that comes through that infrastructure bill. Thank you so much for having me. And it's not just the infrastructure bill that President Biden and, you know, the Biden-Harris administration has done for working people. Um, you heard from our president, President McGarvey, talk about the pension relief, too. You know, that is truly something that was life changing for thousands and thousands of union workers in this country. And there was also the Chips and Science Bill and, and the IRA that are creating jobs currently right now. Good, good middle class jobs for working people. I want to go back to the pensions uh, bill for a moment, because we saw President Biden uh, in Florida the other day, and spontaneously, he was walking by someone, and the guy said to him, you saved my pension, you saved my pension. Uh, explain the challenge that uh, people working in these unions had with their pensions that needed to be solved. Lawrence, first off, President Trump did nothing to save his pension. President Biden did. Number one, number two, working people and their pension system has been exposed by corporate greed. In 2008, the, the crash of our economy impacted millions of working people's pensions and the relief that was given to union members and their pensions during the Biden-Harris administration, it literally saved and changed lives. We have a pension fund in our own union that was based in Southern California that needed relief. And we had workers, workers, not corporate owners or not CEOs, get bailed out in the American Rescue Plan and get 15 years of missed pension payments paid back to them. That's what it looks like to build an economy through the middle class and not from the top down. Do the workers know who did that? Listen, we that is the whole reason that our unions came together and endorsed President Biden today. And we have a duty to tell our members the truth. And that is what we're doing. We've started now and we're going to continue through Election Day to tell our members the truth. Because Donald Trump lied to them when he promised Infrastructure Week. It never happened. When he promised to help bail out workers' pensions, it never happened. But under a Biden-Harris administration, it did. Jimmy Williams, Jr., thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you so thank you. much, Lawrence. Thank you. We'll be right back. That is tonight's last word.